Hello, and welcome to New Books in Science, a channel on the New Books Network. My name is Matthew Jordan, and I'm an instructor at McMaster University. Today, I'll be speaking with Mark Zimmer, author of The State of Science and a professor of chemistry at Connecticut College. This book is a sweeping but concise overview of how science works, why it sometimes doesn't, and where it's going in the future. Mark, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for chatting with me today. No, it's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to this. Wonderful. Well, I'm I'm wondering if you could just start by telling me a bit about your academic background and your scientific work. So I'm South African. I grew up in a small little town in South Africa, wanting to be a game warden, um, and went to university intending to study zoology, botany, a little game management, things like that, but ended up failing botany and did really well in chemistry, even though I didn't really want to carry on in chemistry. So I carried, got, did my bachelor's degree in chemistry. Um, it was during the apartheid times. Uh, I wasn't going to go to the military service. So I did a master's in chemistry at which point I had to do, join the military in South Africa. So I left and came to America. And really the only reason I did a PhD in chemistry was to avoid the military service. Um, so maybe this is not such a good story. But I did my PhD and really enjoyed the chemistry, enjoyed the work I did, did a postdoc here as well, and started doing research. Um, I used computers to calculate why proteins in animals give off light. So uh, there's some jellyfish that are fluorescent. They, they give off blue light. Uh, fireflies give off light. And so I'm interested in that chemical process. What's happening? So that's my research. So the, the book is, is really not about that. I've written other books about bioluminescence uh, and how that can be used. But this is just a big overview about of science. And what prompted you to, um, unlike your the previous books you've written, which are more about your scientific research, uh, to write this book about how science works as opposed to the actual technical scientific content? I think you could probably blame Twitter. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 think, I think you can blame Twitter for, for much, much of what goes on in the world. You probably can, yes. <laughs> so I've got a carefully curated list of people that I follow, scientists, journalists, uh, science journalists, Ed Young, Carl uh, Zimmer, um, and then also people like Harari and uh, Steve Pinker. And so there are a number of things that people have written about and thought about, but it's never been put together in one book. And so I thought it would be really cool to have one book that talks a little bit about where science is going. What are the dangers of science sort of shooting ahead of regulations and shooting ahead of um, most governmental structures. Uh, and I think that's where it sort of came at the same time at which you know, people are distrustful of science. Uh, governments, at least at the moment, is getting rid of expert panels. And at a time when we probably need it more than most, right? I can think we can see it with COVID now. Uh, there's, there's a lot, I think, that's in the book that you think to yourself, oh, yeah, oh, COVID's just highlighted this. It's, um, it, did you, you mentioned how science is interacting with government and, um, and society. Did you have to, in the process of writing this book, do, you know, learn um, from other fields that you have not studied and maybe look in the law or politics or history in a way that you had not before? And what was that process like in terms of your own uh, education or re-education in those disciplines? Well, I, I think there are sort of two situations in which I've learned more than in, I've ever learned in college or something like that. And one is teaching a new course. If you teach a new course, you've always got to learn new things. And the other one is actually writing a book. And so part of the book, the book 
actually initially was going to be called the state of science, good science, bad science, new science, old science. And so the new science was going to be, or is, a, a section about all the new happenings in science. And so I wanted to give a broad coverage of what's happening, not just the sort of biomedical field that I'm familiar with, but also things like gravitational waves, which I didn't know anything about. So that was a lot of fun, learning about gravitational waves and then giving it to people in the physics department and saying, please check that I haven't made some awful mistakes here. Um, and, yeah, the same CRISPR regulations, you know, what are the regulations in the U.S.? Uh, but luckily, science and nature often have sort of news briefs that are fairly easily to read for the, the non-expert. And so I got a lot of information from that, I think. Maybe most of the book is actually just a collection of other ideas. Very little is my own fresh thinking. I've put it together in a big context. But, but it, it, it's putting together ideas of other people. Great. Well, uh, I'd love to now dig into some of the ideas that you discuss in the book. There's, there's as you say, um, there's old science, new science, good science, and bad science. Maybe let's start with the old. Um, how has the notion of what it means to be a scientist changed over time? You you discuss kind of the, the origin of many of these institutions and we often take for granted that what it means to be a scientist today is that you work in a university or government lab or something like that, but it's not always been like that. So maybe you could speak about, yeah, how just even science or scientist as a concept has changed. I, I guess really the interesting part, right, is if you go back in time, um, there were people doing science and they could pretty much understand all the science that was being done which, of course, is impossible now. You can't even understand all the chemistry that's being done. There's so much being done. And those scientists um, often would write books and letters to, to friends describing the science. So, so one of the big changes was really publications, writing publications. And um, those publications allowed scientists to do chunks of work, uh, which, which was a new sort of concept. Before that, everybody would have to think through the whole theory, Darwin with evolution, from beginning to end, and then write up everything in a book instead of writing little pieces. So instead of having a book, we now have, I use an analogy of a, a puzzle. We have a puzzle, and, and, and the scientist would just publish a couple of puzzle pieces and then other scientists would put them together and add some more pieces and slowly the puzzle gets put together and you get more of an idea of what's happening in this whole area of research. So that was one of the big uh, changes. The name, of course, changed as well. First it was natural philosopher um, and then scientists were sort of derived to be parallel to artist. So this was somebody who was actually doing something, doing science. So scientist was somebody doing science, not somebody just thinking about scientists. That, that's a really big change. And then just more recently, um, there's been a change to reward practical science rather than theoretical basic science. We went sort of through a stage where basic science was getting a lot of attention and funding now basic science is sort of losing that attention, which is really dangerous and sad, and more applied science and techniques is, are getting more funding, which, of course, is maybe a short-term pragmatic solution, but maybe in the long term we have to go and have find a good mix between basic science and um, technologies and applied science. So I think those are some of the, well, the changes that I can think of of right now. What about even in terms of uh, the funding of science, right? Presumably um, back in the day, science was largely based on, you know, patronage or just being a wealthy gentleman scientist. But we've kind of evolved into this structure where we have 
grant giving institutions or universities or even the military in some cases uh, funding science. Yes, I mean, now there's very little science that an individual could easily fund for themselves. Um, it's incredibly rare. And we have GoFundMe pages now, but basically all they can do is if they can get a project started. You can't get enough money to sustain a whole project. So we have foundations, we have companies, um, and the government, of course, funding. And that leads to people sometimes overhyping their results. Um, so to get a grant or to get a continuation of a grant, you have to have results. So sometimes things are published a little too soon. They might not be quite mature yet. Um, but in order to apply for the next three years, you have to publish them. So, so that, that's definitely one of the dangers. Also, um, there are some interesting studies that have shown that a lot of the people who are writing grants are actually writing grants that they think will get funded, not grants that they think are their best ideas. Hmm. So the best ideas, and I've certainly seen that with myself, there have been some ideas that I've thought, wow, that's a great idea. Uh, they just get shot down because there isn't enough um, support in the literature for these ideas because they're on on the margins. So I, I think that's probably one of the ways in which science is going to have to change. There's going to be a way of, of having people funded based just on their backgrounds and their work ethic and their knowledge and, and mm -hmm. not having to come up with uh, ideas that will appeal to the lowest common denominator. Right. You also speak about um, citizen science or community science, the fact that, especially in the age of the internet, there are large-scale um, online global projects that multiple people can collaborate on. I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit about yeah, the role of non-scientists and the public even in helping advance, answer scientific questions. Well, I think maybe the easiest one is nature, right? Um, if everybody, we have the internet uh, and you see a bird that's unusual in, in the area, you just log on to iNaturalist uh, and you record that bird. Uh, after a year, you can have a couple of millions of, of sightings of birds, and that gives you the opportunity to, maybe not you, but but some zoologist or ornithologist, <laughs> um, to to look at all this data and interpret it and see mass movements of birds, see if something strange is happening. Um, in my own area, uh, I, I study how proteins fold and then how that influences light. Um, but we often have our computers on in the background and it's not doing anything. And there are a whole bunch of programs you can download. One, the most famous one is um, Folding at Home. And what it does is if the computer has been standing idle for five minutes or you can set it for a length of time, it starts using your computer power together with the computer power of all, typically about 100,000 other computers that are running at the same time, to do calculations. And you can imagine for somebody who's doing big calculations, that's a lot of computer power at a very low cost because you don't have to update the system. You don't have to look after the computer. I mean, the people who are doing this, who have the computer, are doing all of this for you. And so right now with COVID, um, they're doing a whole bunch of calculations trying to in inhibit the virus um, by binding small proteins um, to the spikes that are on the outside of, of the virus. And, and so just by pretty much doing nothing, you can contribute to the uh, research. So that there, that there are a number of ways like that in which citizen research occurs. There are um, like maker spaces 
where instead of making things um, with tools, um, there are biochemical maker spaces. Um, Genspace is, is one, for example, in Brooklyn. Uh, and you can go and for a minimal fee and with some training, you can use all the equipment they have and you can do your own science. Uh, so teachers who, who've done, got a degree in biochemistry, for example, or a doctor who's got an idea can go there and try and do some experiments. Uh, it's a little dangerous in some cases because with CRISPR, you can now do quite amazing things for very little money. And so there are people who, who are really worried about this. Um, in Genspace, they're very careful about what people do. But but in other places, there are more biohackers, uh, and they are doing some irresponsible experiments in which they genetically modify themselves or try and genetically modify themselves. Hmm. Yeah, we can definitely speak a bit more about CRISPR specifically later. You profile in the book the four scientific breakthroughs of the last decade that that you believe are um, fundamental or, or important, and, and CRISPR is one of them. So, so I'd love to speak about that specifically in a bit. Um, in a, a, a good chunk of the book is dedicated to speaking about uh, gender and racial disparities in science um, and uh, equity in the field. Um, I can. It, it, this is clearly a topic that you are uh, invested in and, and passionate about, which is, of course, very important. Where are we right now in terms of equity in science? What is the makeup of the scientific community uh, demographically or culturally? And maybe to anyone who is not convinced that thinking about this kind of thing matters, what would you say to emphasize the uh, importance of making sure that that science is is open to everyone, regardless of their background. So, so where we are, it, it really depends on how you look at it. Um, if you go back to the 70s and you look at the gender breakdown of, of students, um, there were about 10% more males in, as undergraduates than females. That's flipped so uh, typically now incoming students are more female than male. But then as you go on along the career sort of trajectory, that definitely changes. And by the time you get to professors in chemistry, professors in uh, physics, there are definitely many more males. Uh, if you go and look at the Nobel Prizes, for example, uh, in physics, uh, there have just there have been a couple of hundred um, winners, and only a handful uh, have been female. That's not because they haven't done the great work; it's just because their work often hasn't been recognized. There are quite a few uh, Nobel physics laureates where the partner, who was a female, did most of the work, um, and she doesn't get the recognition. But the professor, Otto Hahn, is a famous example. Lisa Meitner worked and did really most of the work and came up with most of the ideas, yet he got the Nobel Prize and she didn't. So that's a very common um, occurrence. Uh, I mean, I personally think that it's getting better and better. It's still got quite a while to go. But definitely the bigger difference is in race. Um, and if you go and look in some fields, for example, computational chemistry or um, high plasma, high temperature plasma physics, you will find that there may be zero um, African American PhDs granted a year. And so there the problem is really deeply rooted. Um, I come from South Africa. And I've always been in South Africa you know, exposed to discrimination and I've been very interested in trying to help when I came to America. And I go and do outreach programs and workshops at local schools. And it's actually got worse. So the schools in our area that have more money have become more white 
and the schools that have less money and don't have laptops for students, don't have lab space for students, have become more black. Uh, and so with that problem really at the base, it's really difficult for universities to try and do that. Now, there are many, many programs that do the, do that and do try and um, give everybody an equal chance at succeeding. Um, but it, it's a losing battle at the moment. Now, why should we do that? Uh, yeah, just yesterday, um, the Department of Immigration um, put a halt on students coming to America uh, if they're registered at a university where they're learning with online courses. Um, for science to progress, we need as many excellent minds working on these problems as possible. So A, we need immigrants. B, we need women. We need men. We need black. We need white. We need as many scientists as possible. But also all people come with different backgrounds and different ways of looking at problems, different educations. Just the fact that I went to university in South Africa in which um, I was sort of programmed to do science. I did no liberal arts courses or anything like that, just chemistry, 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 gives me a different way of looking at things and then collaborating with somebody um, from Finland and somebody from America. We all have ways of looking at it. So just getting more scientists, getting more Ways of looking at the problem will help us solve really big problems that we have. And I think the biggest one would be climate change. So if we want to do something about climate change, we need more scientists working on the problem. And doing something about uh, discrimination and bias in science is really important to me and should be important to anybody interested in science, I think. Yeah, that's really... Um interesting and, and and disappointing, upsetting uh, what you were speaking about, some of these racial disparities actually getting worse uh, in the time that you've been uh, living in the United States and, 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 and focusing on this issue. Do you have any uh, advice or tips for scientists who are maybe um, interested in this in the way you are, understand how important uh, diversity is in the scientific field? As you say, our, our our discipline can only gain from having more voices and more experiences and, and more backgrounds and um but but maybe don't know what to do about it right if you're at no point in anyone's uh, scientific training is one ever <laughs> taught how to address these issues you just kind of have to figure it out for for yourself so um what can what can young scientists do basically or grad students or even uh, professors for that matter if they're if 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 they want to make a dent in this issue? Yes, my thinking has changed a little bit. Uh, I first thought that the most important way I could do it was by helping out at local middle schools and high schools and doing workshops with students. Um, But I've sort of changed in the last 20 years, and I think it's actually more important to make sure and mentor Students uh, of color, underrepresented students who come through the college where I teach, um, to help them become mentors for other students and to become role models for students. So um, I've now had many students that I've taken under my wing who've got PhDs uh, in chemistry. So the fact that you have a student of color from the Bronx, first generation student, who has now got a PhD and can be seen by other students, I think that is is really the most important way that I found that I could help. Um, it, it is to put role models out there, to mentor students. Um, it, sometimes their problems are so small. And if you are in the mentoring position that they trust you and they can tell you the problems, it's so easy to help students. Uh, they just need to find somebody on campus. And you know, they come on campus uh, 
They come from a huge, big school. They were the best students in the school. They already feel a little intimidated because all the other students come with so much more. Uh, they don't really know who they can talk to, where they can get help, and be that person. You know, um, get a reputation am amongst the students of color that, you know, I don't know, it's an old white guy, but he's going to help and he's going to talk to you and um, you know, fight for you. So I think if you can get that sort of reputation, that that's really useful. That's great. Yeah. And I really hope that the people reading your book or listening to this interview definitely take um, take these ideas to heart because, you know, it's not enough to just focus on the, the science of the science, right? Science is a human activity involving human people doing this work. And if in if our community is not as strong and, and healthy as it can be, then then the science suffers because of it. And also just as a general ethical principle. Um, you know, making sure that that everyone within our field feels welcome um, is is important, and it is definitely sad at the time of this recording to see that the United States is actively making it more difficult for that to happen for many um, many students coming from abroad. Um, yeah, ethical and moral, uh, an ethical, moral, and a pragmatic reason. Right, exactly. It's nice when those things align. Um, I'd like to pivot now to speaking about the scientific publication process. Uh, every scientist knows that we have something called peer review, and every scientist probably dislikes to some degree uh, participating in the process of peer review. It takes a long time. It's it's messy. You get reviews from people you don't like who disagree with you. Um, it can be very frustrating, the process of uh, send, re sending refereed papers to journals. How is this process of peer review something new? Is it something that's always existed in science? Um, and and if so, how has it changed over the years to give us our current system where journals are not paying scientists to publish in them, but are rather just kind of accepting all this scientist's work and then paying and then charging universities to or, or individuals to buy these articles and then publish them to the world? How did that system come about? And was it always that way? So it's actually been around for a, a long, long time. Um, uh, and the alternatives really, um, there aren't any really good alternatives. Now, the COVID pandemic has really brought out some of the shortcomings because, well, when COVID came around, we didn't know much about it. We knew it was a SARS virus, so we sort of knew what class it was in and so on, but we didn't know much about it. So what we certainly needed was more information. But the way peer review works is researchers do some work in the lab, they come up with a theory, they get data for it, prove it, and then send it to a journal. The journal editor looks at it. If the editor thinks it fits in the journal, they then send it to experts in the field who read it and decide whether it, it really lives up to those journal standards and if it all makes sense. Um, that process takes a long time. And science in general just takes a long time. But when you have something like COVID, now suddenly we need results very quickly. And what's even worse is if you're an epidemiologist and you've written a really important paper, you send it to the journal, the editor reads it, realizes it's an important paper, sends it to really good epidemiologists. But of course, they're working on COVID. They're incredibly busy. So they don't want to spend the time. And it takes an average about five hours to review a paper, read through it completely and, and write the review. So um, COVID has sort of shown that, yes, the peer review is, is pretty decent at doing quality control, but it's really not good at doing quickly. And so, so that, that's one of the problems with, with peer review research. If something's published in science and nature and cell, really those are the three big important ones, we, we can be pretty sure, oh, yeah, this is legitimate science. Um, and you know, sometimes something slips through the cracks, but typically we, we know that that's really good science. But it's taken a long time to do this quality control. 
So the researchers get government money funding or foundation funding to do the research. Um, they write the paper for free. Um, they send it to the, the journal. The journal then sends it to external reviewers. They read it for free. So three, four um, reviewers at five hours each, all doing this for free. They send back their comments and then the researcher goes back, does the corrections, and then the journal publishes the paper. And the researcher and the institution where the researcher then has to pay typically thousands of dollars to buy this subscription to this journal. And if I wanted to read it and I go onto the internet, I have see, oh, you know, to read this one article costs $40, $50. So it's a very, very strange system in which the, the government pays for the researcher to do the work. The reviewers do the work for nothing. The researchers write it up for nothing. And the big companies get a lot of money. Um, so, so that's really definitely one of the problems with it. Um, there's something new now called preprints in, in which if you've got something that's not quite mature yet, but it's really 90% done, you can publish this on an archive um, and other scientists can see it and can comment about it and so on, and you can improve your paper. And so now you can put up things before they get peer-reviewed uh, at some point when you're ready, you send it off for peer review. Uh, the problem with these preprints is, especially now with COVID, is everybody feels that they're an expert in COVID. And the amount of, I don't know, call them trashy papers, preprints that have been put out there has just skyrocketed. And so if you're looking for some new goods, good stuff. You, you have to know who the people are or you have to have somebody who's doing this sort of seeping through and finding the good stuff amongst the preprints. So the preprints have turned out to be really good at doing the fast, but they can't do the quality control that peer-reviewed journals do. So we're in this sort of interesting position in which I think the way science is published is going to change. Another thing with we were talking before about equity, um, the process in which peer review is done is um, a single blind. So the right, people who write the paper send it off, and they never find out who reviewed the paper. But the reviewers know who wrote the paper. And so often there could be gender bias or bias just, oh, yeah, this was done at Harvard and Ivy League school. It's got to be right. And so it's more likely to be accepted than something that was done uh, in an African university, for example. Um, so there, there are some journals now that are starting um, a process where both the researcher and the reviewer can see each other's names. So it's a bit more of an open process. And then when the people read the journal, they can actually see what the reviewers wrote. Um, and the paper then, with time, can also get evaluated a year or two years later. So, so there's, there's much more of a quality control. And I think that's the way research publication is going to go. Do, do you think that... Um there will be like new structures or products or, I mean, yeah, w w maybe you can outline for us, say 10, 20, 30 years from now, some at some horizon in the future, what if the system kind of reformed itself or was working well, a scientist writing a paper, what that process might look like in a future where, you know, some of these issues were resolved? <sighs> Um, yeah, so what's got to change is why people are writing them. So since the Second World War, the number of papers has doubled nearly every nine years. 
So people are writing lots, lots more papers. And the reason they're writing these papers is not to improve scientific knowledge and science. Instead, they're writing papers because papers have become the currency of science. If you want to get promoted, if you want a new job, um, how many papers you have and how many papers you have in good journals is really um, what's going to determine whether you get a new job or whether you get funded in your research. So publishing really has become to, come to the sort of stage where it's important to publish as much and as quickly as possible rather than um, getting together a complete, very solid picture and publishing maybe one or two papers, it's way better to publish six or seven um, marginal papers in good journals. So you know, my hope would be that in the future that somehow changes, um, that the incentives for publishing uh, change. And so the tenure system changes, the, fu the funding system changes, that the, the number of publications doesn't become that important. Uh, and, and then people will be publishing more substantial papers and, and high quality stuff. That's, that's my hope. So, so some people ha have come up with the ideas that uh, nobody should be allowed to publish more than five or 10 papers a year. You know, there's a limit. So um, what that means is if you've got more stuff, well, you put it in, in one of your 10 papers and you make sure that they're really good 10 papers rather than publishing some. There are some people who publish about 100 papers uh, a year, so one paper every three days, um, which is ridiculous. So also, if, if you go and look um, in the uh, published literature, 25 million papers have never been cited before. So that means nobody is, who's read it thinks they're worth referencing in their papers. Wow. So you know, to find work that's good, you've got to go through all of that and sort of find the, the little gems that you need. Uh, and it's, it's costing lots of time and effort. And that's what I'm hoping to change. Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a very dark statistic about all those unread papers. And that, that doubling time every nine years, I mean, as more and more people go into science, I mean, historians of science uh, have profiled just how much, um, for instance, in the wake of World War II, this overinvestment in the training of physicists led to uh, this huge bubble of all these people going into physics because they needed it to support, you know, the nuclear state. But then at a certain point when the Cold War kind of started to wane, there were all these people with physics degrees who, uh, who were out of jobs. Now, we don't necessarily have that particular problem. That is to say, many academics, um, many people who want to become scientists uh, often struggle to find academic positions, but we have this other problem where we've got this almost paper publishing bubble where um, the uh, the demand for the actual content of the papers cannot even close to keep up with the supply that's being written because papers, some publications are the you know the the economy of uh, of of scientific currency. So it's it's really yeah it's really that's that's a that's a that's a difficult situation, and I. I I have nothing but admiration and respect for the people on the inside trying to trying to change these systems. Yeah, it's a very difficult one to change, right? Because the whole system is built on this. Yeah. It's interesting too, just thinking about um, the early days of science, you know, kind of the Republic of Letters, the um the foundations that science was built on, which was kind of this apprenticeship model where people would travel to go learn from a master almost, and you would get a, a degree or you would just get your training. And kind of the university was uh, a place where this kind of apprenticeship model could be housed, but the scientific community was extraordinarily small. So everyone could kind of be in touch with each other. And given that constraint, a small community where everyone is trained at the same few uh, institutions and you know, everyone in the field kind of knows each other or is in contact or is at least one degree removed through some central hub who exchanges letters and mail between all of these um, between all of these researchers, then the model we have kind of works. But in a world where anyone can upload anything to the archive or a preprint server and, you know, every university on the planet is pumping out scientific research at a, at a record clip, 
this uh, this system's got to change. Well, yeah. Um, I'd love to now uh, turn to um, maybe the future of science and some of the important uh, discoveries of the last decade. You profile four in your book. You talk about um, one in physics, uh, LIGO and gravitational waves, deep learning and AI, optogenetics and CRISPR. Um, I, I would I would happily spend an hour just speaking with you about each of these. Um optogenetics that is most closely related to your own research so maybe you could speak about um what the crucial developments have been there maybe say a bit about what optogenetics actually is because it's maybe not a household term uh, what the crucial developments have been there and um yeah what the what the state of the art is and where we're going yeah so opto you know means uh, with light and genetics is genetically modified um so I, I study fluorescent prote- proteins. These are proteins that come from a jellyfish. Uh, they came through about 20, 30 years of research, just basic research, trying to figure out you know, why are these jellyfish giving off light? Uh, and then after all that, um, suddenly people found out, oh, they could use this as a biosensor. So you could genetically modify a protein You hang the fluorescent protein at the end of it. It's like a light bulb at the end of it. You can see where the protein goes to. So that was sort of one of the first um, uses of genetic modifications to to see what's happening. Um, It turns out that in a neuron, when the neuron fires, uh, one of the biggest changes in that neuron is the change in increase of calcium ions. There's a large, large increase in the number of calcium ions inside the neuron when it fires. So you can genetically modify fluorescent proteins so they only light up when there's calcium. So if you genetically modify a whole bunch of neurons in a brain, um, you can do this in a mouse, and you can take the part of the mouse's skull, replace it with a glass window, and you can now genetically modify the neurons that go from the whisker to the cerebral cortex, which is on top of its brain. And um, then when you blow on the whiskers, the whiskers sense this, the neuron fires, and the neurons associated with sensing the movement of the whiskers light up. So you now have a way of seeing sort of mind reading. You can see when certain neurons are firing. So uh, in the late 1990s, uh, early uh, 2000s, some scientists were starting to think, whoa, can we use this property to actually make the neurons fire? And it turns out that if you had a big, big aquarium with some algae in it, now the algae are single cellular, Um, They don't have noses and mouths and eyes or something like that. But if you keep these algae and you release them in the center of the massive aquarium and you turn on a light somewhere, the algae move towards the light. So how do they do that? Well, it turns out they've got these things we call eye spots. And on the eye spots are molecules called channel rhodopsin. It's like a channel. And... If blue light, and blue light travels the furthest in water, if blue light hits this channel, the channel opens, and the ions in the water, the sodium and the calcium, can come through the channel rhodopsin, and then the algae will move in that direction. So the thought was, hey, can we steal the recipe, the gene for making channel rhodopsin from this algae and put it in a neuron? You put it in a neuron, you shine blue light on the neuron, the neuron fires, or calcium comes in, and the neuron fires. And and so now you can actually see what happens when you have a neuron firing. Um, So, for example, one thing that was done is in a whole bunch of neurons on the right-hand side of a brain were genetically modified, and they were known to be involved with um, motion. And so if you shine a light on these neurons there on the right side of the brain, the mouse will move, 
but because it's on the right side of the brain, it'll then turn to the left. Switch off the light, the mouse stops completely. Now you can find uh, neurons that are involved with aggression, um, and the mouse is quite placid. Until you turn on the light that activates these neurons, then the mice get more aggressive. Um, so really, optogenetics is all about using light to activate neurons. Um, most of this research is all in the mouse stage at this point, but there are some human um, experiments, um, especially in the eye, because the eye is sort of isolated. So if something goes wrong in the eye, you, you can stop it easier. And so macular degeneration, um, oh no, oh, retinosis pigmentosa, different um, eye disease, is being treated with optogenetics. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, in patients like this, the um, cells that detect the light in the eye uh, are no longer active. They don't work. But if you replace them with channel rhodopsin, the light will activate the channel rhodopsin, and then the channel rhodopsin can send the message to the optic nerve, and the person can get that message. Uh, and so there's a lot of research being done. There are now trials with patients that are actually being done in Texas um, that involve having uh, very clever glasses that change the wavelengths of the light so that the patients can actually now see because the light hits this algae protein that's in the eye and then activates the optic nerve and sends the message where it normally would go to. Wow. That, I mean, that's, yeah, that's some incredible uh, work and it's exciting to see just how much potential there is for that kind of uh, research going into the future. And I suppose there's no telling just how widely it could be applied um, in the human body and beyond. Um, now, there are three other uh, technologies or sciences that you uh, profile in the book, LIGO, um, deep learning, CRISPR. Um, I, I'm, I'm mindful of the time here because I do have a couple more questions. So if people are uh, interested, they will, they, will, they will just have to read the book to, to find out here the, uh, why, the, why those others are important. I, of course, am somewhat biased. I teach courses on uh, the history and ethics of AI. So I uh, think deep learning is important, of course, if, if slightly overhyped. Um, now, let me just turn to the final set of questions that I have for you. Uh, which is about um, kind of the forces in the world that are trying to um, maybe erode trust in science or are opposing the institutions of science. We've heard a lot about uh, fake news and alternative facts. Do you think that science is under attack right now? Um, and what can we do to bolster trust and robustness in the scientific enterprise? Hmm. I, I think science is in a difficult position right now um, with both fake news, where, where some people just don't want to believe what science is saying, um, because it doesn't fit in, in their big picture. And, and this is not just from the right, it's also from the left. So we see this in climate change denial, um, but we also see this in people who continue believing that uh, genetically modified organisms are unhealthy um, or that believe that vaccination uh, causes autism. So, so yes, there, there are a number of issues that are really important in which the science is no longer being trusted. I, I, I see it at... The college where I teach, where, where, where some faculty come up with the craziest and weirdest ideas and, and think that scientific theories and facts that have already matured, that we know to be correct, are debatable. Um, and so uh, one of the big problems, I think, is that science is, is not like math. So in mathematics, you have a proof and the proof and, and some physics proofs, classical especially, it's 100% proof. 
provable that this is the case. Uh, the way science works is you have a theory, then you put out the theory, and then a lot of people do experiments to see if the theory is correct. And when the vast, vast majority of experiments show the theory is correct, um, then the theory gets accepted. There isn't a sort of a linear path to acceptance. Um, there are lots of paths, and some of them are, are false, and sometimes it, it, it's right. And so it's very easy to pick apart science by, by finding one of these paths that have gone off that weren't right. And so, for example, with climate change, you know, we've known about climate change for at least 150 years, uh, and the proof's there. But but it's very easy to to say, well, it's not 100% sure. Uh, even though we're quite willing to fund um, terrorists coming to blow up something, we're, we're not 100% sure that they're going to come either. So, But with science, that, that's happened, and it's become a political thing. And I, I think also another part is there's this, I don't know much about psychology, but definitely the, there's this cognitive bias where we – um, give more respect to confident and loud voices. And this is often, often results in gender bias, but it also backfires on scientists because scientists are always more likely to say, yes, uh, the proof seems to be showing that rather than, oh, I'm 100% sure this is the answer. And so I think that science is just vulnerable because of that. And so I am a little worried with the sort of lack of expertise advice and acceptance of expertise advice. So we see that in countries like Germany and New Zealand, um, experts, epidemiologists have been involved in trying to combat COVID. In, in America, in many of the populist countries like Brazil, that hasn't been the case. So experts haven't been involved from the beginning and expert advice has not been trusted. And that hasn't worked so well. Um, had it worked, I, I'm also really worried. You can imagine if we have all the social distancing and at the end of all the social distancing, the numbers go down. Well, the sort of science deniers would say, well, if we hadn't had social distancing, um, nothing would have happened. The science isn't right. It's a bit of an argument that anti-vaxxers use, right? So. We don't need a vaccine because nobody is really getting measles right now. Of course, that's because most people still have vaccines. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a tricky situation, especially with COVID, as you say. And it's really interesting what you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, namely that obviously your book was written before the coronavirus pandemic, but so much in it, uh, in the wake of what we're going through now. As a, as a country and as a world, uh, it just really reinforces a lot of these challenges and a lot of these issues. And hopefully the past couple of months have shown us just how valuable science is. I mean, if, if, if our hopes are, you know, to get a vaccine, that's a, that's a scientific process that involves immense knowledge of, uh, biochemistry and, and medicine and more. And so these institutions functioning properly, including peer review, representation from diverse groups in science, uh, robust understanding of scientific knowledge, and uh, many of the new techniques that have been developed over the past uh, years and decades are all going to help us uh, come out on the other side of this crisis and, of course, future crises, because one of the main purposes of science is that it's uh, we we don't know in advance what knowledge will be useful. So science is the pursuit of learning as much as we can about ourselves and the natural world because we we can never know what will be um what will be valuable to uh to crises past, present and future. Um I'm wondering before we wrap up here if there's anything else you would like to uh add about the book. Uh, and if not, then we can then we can wrap things up. But if, is there anything else you want to uh, discuss that that you talk about in the book? Well, I think that really the most important issue facing us, much more than COVID right now, is climate change. Um, and so we're going to have to do something about climate change. And really, all we can do will involve trusting scientists, because climate change is a really thorny problem because it's a gas that we can't see. Um, doing things 
that seem quite normal, right? A change in, in, in weather, um, a slight movement in infectious diseases. So, so that that's really going to be the big problem of the future, and that's why I think it's really important that we get to the point where we trust science and scientists. Yeah, and that definitely. I'll put in there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, we've covered in this conversation only a fraction of what is actually in the book. The book is titled "The State of Science." Um, has it been released, or is it, what is the release date, and how can people find it if they if they want to buy it? It's going to be released July twentieth, and it can be found in you know all the normal places: Barnes and Noble, Amazon, um, on the internet. Wonderful. Well, yes, it's a it's a um, it's a fantastic book, especially I would say both for scientists who are maybe kind of bubbled up in their own you know sub sub discipline and want a broader perspective on how science works at the big level, but also for non specialists who are interested from the outside in understanding. Um, if they've only ever learned, you know, science from high school biology class, that's that's a bit about the knowledge of science, but the process of uh, what it's like to do science and uh, how science works. Um, it, 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 th- this book is a, is a fantastic overview and I, and I definitely recommend it. Well, um, uh, Mark Zimmer, thank you so much for uh, speaking with me today about this state of science. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed talking to you. Me as well. Bye-bye. Bye.